good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to AdAge's webcast, sponsored by Synthesio. The topic of today's webcast is how to build a customer-centric social organization. I'm Christopher Hosford with the AdAge team, and I'm your moderator today. We have just a few quick items to go over before we begin. Now, we'll hear from today's presenters, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. To participate in the Q&A portion of the webcast, all you have to do is type your question into the Ask a Question text area, and then click the Submit button. Uh, you can submit your questions at any time during the webcast, and we'll address as many of them as time permits after our presenter's prepared remarks. Now, please also note the series of widgets that are available to, uh, for you toward the bottom of the console. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Greg Roth is Vice President of Global Marketing at Synthesio. Greg is a pioneer in the social software as a service space, having spent the last 10 years educating brands and agencies on strategic best practices and the power of data-driven digital marketing. Greg provides strategy and execution across multiple facets of Synthesio's marketing machine, while driving development of sales acceleration, product education, and digital content deliverables. And John Murphy, our second presenter, is Director of Social Media at Aetna. John leads social media strategy development, planning, and execution of, in support of Aetna's overall brand strategy. He oversees social media channel strategy, community management, listening, governance, and training that drives the enterprise brand strategy and creates unique, authentic, and memorable connections with customers. Greg, uh, you're the first presenter. It's all yours, sir. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Chris. I'm sorry about that. So we're going to jump right into it. Uh, today, we're going to speak about building an organization that is prepared for social intelligence. Uh, we're gonna break this down into four separate uh, sections today. The first section is going to uh, concentrate on how to build that social organization, what types of social organizations exist out there, and which one might potentially be best for your company. Then we'll uh, step it up a level into aligning those teams with use cases and business objectives so that the team is prepared to accept the, the social intelligence and distribute it across the organization. Then we're going to get into some hypothetical social intelligence use cases uh, where I'll go through uh, common use cases that we typically deal with with our clients and how uh, these hypothetical companies and use cases can be uh, activated in the real world. And then I'll turn things over to our guest speaker, uh, John from Aetna, who will uh, bring us into the real world, take my hypothetical examples and give us an example of how Aetna leverages social intelligence. So the first part, as I mentioned, is uh, about building an organization that's ready for social intelligence. So um, I've been around the block a few times and I've seen social teams structured in many different ways. And when I talk about four common types of social organizations here, we're not you know, saying that, that you must stick to these four. These are general groupings uh, by which I'll give you examples about how uh, you can use social data to inform communications across teams so that you can begin to uh, improve your marketing communications, corporate communications, sales, customer service, uh, basically anything that might uh, benefit from intelligence gleaned from the market and from people speaking in real time. So we've got these four common types of social organizations. The first, the autonomous collective. The second, the collaborative hub. The third, the social socket. And fourth, the global enterprise matrix. So I'm gonna get into the autonomous collective first. So when you look at this grouping, uh, it's a small team, best for small to medium-sized businesses with uh, limited needs for content production and audience management. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a small company. So 
if you've got a company that doesn't invest heavily in consumer-based marketing, like you're an energy concern or a biotech company or you're in waste management, uh, you might have a small social team or marketing team set up, and you're still going to be able to leverage social intelligence and the data that is being generated by uh, people on social media every single day. So in this autonomous collective, I broke it down into six separate pods. Now, in this case, these could be individual employees or they could be small teams, but uh, I'll speak about it as if these are individual employees. So you have a small marketing team in your company, uh, and this is how I would recommend setting it up if you wanted to leverage data and become a more data-driven organization. So your community manager at number one is obviously going to be responsible for the day-to-day -day communication with your audience across social platforms. And the content marketer is going to work very closely with that community manager, developing the content which is being dispersed across the internet. Your analyst then is going to live in a place where they are um, looking at the performance of past social campaigns and determining what worked and what didn't work and then feeding that intelligence to the content marketer, the community manager, the digital marketer, the PR and communications manager, and the media planner. So you see that social intelligence here is plugged into the analyst, and it's also plugged into PR and communications, because no matter what size your business is, you're still going to be need, need to set yourself up uh, to prepare for a potential crisis or some type of outside influence that could negatively impact your business. So keeping an eye on what people are saying on the internet, not just about your business, but about the industry and the industries that your business touches is really, really important. It's like a proactive form of risk management. So we've got this analyst plugged into social intelligence and the PR and communications department plugged into social intelligence. And then we have our digital marketer and our media planner who are benefiting from the data that's being gleaned by that analyst and that PR and communications team so that they can better do their jobs. They can understand which channels to concentrate their media on, what times of day people are most likely to interact with messaging from the brand, uh, and you know, generally just optimize the marketing process. Now, obviously, with a small team, you've got advantages and disadvantages. In this case, uh, the primary advantages here would be that you're agile. You can quickly pivot and improv. If something topical comes up, you've got a small enough team and uh, you know a minimal amount of red tape, you can begin to leverage things that are happening as they happen. You also have a unified team here, which is an advantage, because you're consistent and self-aware. Everybody knows what everybody else on the team is doing because you work very closely together. You're also accountable because people have clear responsibilities in a small team. So if something goes wrong or something goes right, the right person uh, gets fingers pointed at them. But also, you know, a small team has disadvantages. First of all, it's dependent. So your capabilities are likely tied to your discipline. So if your community manager uh, goes on his honeymoon and disappears for two weeks and you desperately need somebody to manage a crisis on social media, you don't have an expert to stand in for them. It's also fragile, which means the crisis is going to disrupt everything in a small team like this. So uh, suddenly you have a well-informed content plan. You've strategically uh, presented an outlook for how you're going to communicate to your audience for the next 12 months, and all of a sudden a crisis happens, and you're forced to change that entire plan and really pivot uh, in a difficult way if you're a small organization. It's like having a grenade thrown into uh, a set of bowling pins. It's just going to basically explode everything that you've planned. And then you also have the disadvantage of being sheltered. So all of your content is coming from one source. No matter how much research you do on what the market wants to hear, if your entire team is geographically isolated, there's a good chance that your communication is going to be informed by your personal perspective. So you have the disadvantage of being sheltered in the way that you look at the world. The next type of social organization is the collaborative hub. So when we're looking at this organization, we're not looking at it from an individual employee perspective, but from a team perspective. And you can see here, we've got the standards, marketing, PR, communication, 
customer care and sales, customer insights, and product service and expertise. And we have social intelligence plugged in at the top and the bottom of this collaborative hub, which is best for companies which want to combine thought leadership and subject matter expertise to drive their social execution. So we've plugged social intelligence in with marketing and PR and communications, and we've also plugged them in with customer care and customer insights. So what these teams are going to be able to do is leverage the knowledge that they get from social listening, what people are saying about their brand, what they're saying about their industry, what they're saying about their competition. Marketing and PR is going to be able to sculpt their communications, their content, their campaigns based on what they know resonates with their audience. And on the, in the case of customer care and customer insights, we know what the pain points now are. So we're plugged into what people are complaining about, what they might have issues with if you have a specific product. So you're beginning to learn from what the market has trouble with, and then you could begin to shift and pivot and enhance your product or your offering based on what people are saying about it. Now, this is a really common type of social organization. Pods or hubs are becoming even more popular every single day, but they have their advantages and disadvantages. So our advantage is it's eminently scalable, meaning that you can grow each hub with need. You need more people in marketing, you just make that marketing hub bigger. So uh, the shapes are going to get bigger, but your structure is going to remain the same. You're also flexible because you're able to leverage the strengths of many teams. You have a bunch of people who are experts at what they're doing. They're all plugged into one another and communicating, so you can begin to uh, realize benefits across departments. And you also have that transparency because all of the teams are in the game. They're all seeing this data that's coming in. They're communicating on a day-to-day -day basis about what's good about the organization, what's bad about your product, so that they are all plugged into basically this collaborative hub. But we also have our disadvantages in that there may uh, be some accountability problems. Organizations with hubs or pods like this often create a punting culture, meaning that if marketing learns something that they feel is not within their purview, they could potentially punt that to customer care, who looks at it and says, that's not within our realm of uh, our job description, so let's punt this over to sales. So it becomes the type of thing where because you have these pods working very closely together, they become protective over what they're responsible for. Then you have uh, the idea of reliability. A uh, little typo there, but red tape ruins innovation, meaning that because you have no centralized hub in charge of social intelligence or distributing that intelligence or creating strategy around that intelligence, you have no reliability when it comes to creating uh, more innovative strategies as a result of that data. You have to get approvals across multiple different teams and potentially across multiple different levels of the organization before you begin to enact your strategies and activate what you need to activate. You also have the problem of being solitary within your hub. These silos are transparent. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing, but you're inescapable. You can't get out of this hub. So, you know, like I was saying, they become very protective and marketing is then just aligned with what marketing has to do. And you're missing out on opportunities for idea generation and innovation if these pods are living in silos with glass walls. So we'll move on to the social socket. The social socket probably looks familiar to a lot of you. It's the basic hub and spoke model, but I changed it a little bit here and plugged in social intelligence uh, up and down the hub and spoke. So this is typically best for enterprise businesses with a single marketing team driven by uh, some type of executive vision. And what you see in the middle of the hub and spoke here is the social intelligence stakeholder. This is the person who's going to be responsible for uh, basically, you know, uh, advocating for social intelligence across the organization and selling it in across departments as being a value. And you see that number two has got a red outline around it. That's your social intelligence department. So what the social intelligence department is basically made up of is marketing communications and analysts, people who are experts at reading social data and then figuring out who to distribute it to across the socket here. So you see we've got our two social intelligence, uh, our stakeholder and our team, and then 
We've got them plugged in across marketing communications, PR, sales, customer insights, and product and service expertise. Now, everybody is leveraging this information that comes in from uh, social data, but we still do have our advantages and disadvantages of this hub and spoke model, this uh, social socket. So our advantages are going to be that it's informed. Every team is plugged into the data. When we're looking at these, uh, you know, the shape, the social intelligence battery is plugging into each and every single one of them. And also we have this idea of a focused strategy. So our advantage here is that because we have this hub, the social intelligence stakeholder and the social intelligence team, we have a clear cut path or direction for where we want to go with every single piece of data. We know how to distribute it. We know who's going to benefit from each single piece of information. And we also have the ability to leverage our analysts so that they're looking at the data both quantitatively and qualitatively so that everything we're distributing is really informed by insight. We also have the, uh, you know, the advantage of being efficient. So because we're set up in this circle and because we have a single team responsible for uh, distributing this data, there's no forwarding chains required. Like I mentioned in the last model, no one's punting from one to the next because we have basically an operator who's plugging wires into switches and making sure that the connections go to the right place. We also have disadvantages in this model, the disadvantages being uh, it's a bottleneck. Without the hub, the spokes scatter. So if you have a social intelligence stakeholder who leaves to go to another organization and you don't have somebody to plug in in their place, all of a sudden your spokes have nowhere to go. They have nothing to attach to. And all of a sudden your social intelligence has a problem because you've got no one setting strategy or direction, uh, which creates this bottleneck. No one knows where to go. They're basically a car without a map. Then we've got this problem with scalability in terms of because so many teams are touching the social intelligence, the data, the technology, and looking at this data on a day-to-day -day basis, it takes time to train people and it takes effort to learn how to use this technology. So that's the social intelligence stakeholders' secondary task is basically to advocate for this technology within the organization. The last disadvantage uh, is transparency. So the data is distributed by one team, the central socket, into silos. So we don't really have transparency as to what PR and communications might be leveraging that could potentially also be beneficial to marketing or to sales or to customer insights. The last uh, type of social organization is the global enterprise matrix. So you see that familiar social socket living in a much larger organization here. So this is best for enterprises who want to leverage regional marketing teams driven by this centralized brand policy and governance. So in the middle, you have your enterprise social intelligence team, which you know is living in your corporate headquarters, and they're dictating what the other teams need to do and say in a general way about the brand and your product. So number two is your regional team. So this could spread out into innumerable geographic locations. Number three is your executive level reporting. So you're also in charge of taking all of the social report, uh, intelligence and reporting it up to the right people so that they understand uh, what's going on, not just across the organization, but across the internet when it comes to what people are saying about your business. Then you have your thought leadership. What are you learning from social intelligence about your business, your industry, and your competitors that your thought leadership can then use, use to sculpt content, to uh, create their speeches, to create the marketing materials that you send out that prove that your company is the best and at the top of their game. And then you have risk management, which typically doesn't get pulled into the social equation. But when it comes to social intelligence, you have to think about social intelligence as another channel of risk management because you're able to then listen to the world at large and really get ahead of potential crises before they happen. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with like enterprise level teams, you have advantages and disadvantages. So this is scalable, obviously, as an advantage because new pods don't disrupt the, the structure. You could add more regional teams. You could add more thought leadership teams. You could add, add different types of teams. As long as you've got that centralized hub that's distributing the information, your structure is sound. 
you also are transparent because your modularity makes it easier for uh, the social data to be visible. You're distributing across teams and across the organization at the same time, which uh, makes it easy for people to see the value behind it. You also are sturdy because your, uh, your cadence is set by the core. Your social intelligence core at number one is basically setting the policies, government uh, messaging protocol that's being deployed across all of these teams. As far as disadvantages are concerned, it's clunky. Obviously, you have a big organization. There's no room for topical improvisation if all of your messaging is set by corporate guidelines. So you can't take advantage of things that are happening in the news as quickly as smaller organizations. You're also dependent because circuits can't be jumped. If a regional team in Sweden learns something that might be beneficial to a regional team in Brazil, it's very hard for them to get in contact with them. So they can't jump that central circuit. It creates kind of this bottleneck of red tape. We also have the disadvantage of being a, a lack of accountability. So there's missed opportunities, as I mentioned, because we're so spread out across an organization. There's really no transparency when it comes to the learnings across regions. So uh, before we jump into the next section, I'm going to throw things back over to Chris, who's going to hit you with a quick poll question. Great. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, yeah, and, and this is uh, as simple as it could be, uh, a question of our audience. Do you currently have a social listening program? Now, it could be one of the ones that uh, John had mentioned, an autonomous collective, the collaborative hub, the social socket, global enterprise matrix, or <laughs> any uh, other thing that you might have homebrewed. Um, just answer yes or no so we can have a sense of whether you're peering into the social matrix and finding out what they're saying. Now, while we're waiting for, waiting for your answers, remember you can ask questions of our panelists at any time. Just type in your questions at the Ask a Question text area and indicate which of your panelists you'd like to direct your questions to. And I think we've got all of the answers that have come in now that are going to come in, and let's see how we did. Well, it's pretty much 50-50. Uh, which seems to indicate that um, uh, the ones who have a social uh, listening program would like to know more from the expertise in this uh, in this webcast, and those that don't uh, certainly have some learning to do. Uh, Greg, what do you think of these responses? Very interesting. Yeah, kind of similar to the ones that we got last time. You know, uh, social listening is something that's really beginning to take off as people are starting to understand the impact that social media can have on the world at large. I think that, you know, it was something that was a hobby for a lot of people or something they did in their spare time. And when you start to see the world begin to move as a result of social media, uh, social listening, uh, you know, is something that is becoming more and more integral to every business. So what we'll do then uh, is jump right into blueprinting. So by blueprinting, uh, I mean basically setting a map or a framework for exactly how your social uh, intelligence is going to be distributed across your organization. So uh, we have stakeholders in any organization with varying but overlapping social intelligence needs. So you have your CMO, you have your CPO, you have your COO, you see RO, all of them are going to be able to use data, but that data is going to obviously overlap in many cases as to what is beneficial to each team. So uh, by blueprinting common use cases and common business problems to social intelligence KPIs and teams, we're able to uh, map these needs and coordinate a program that links the value to the need. It lets social teams start prioritizing what they need to do in order to roll out a social intelligence program. So the first thing that we'll talk about then are what are common social intelligence use cases. So, um, you know, not going to get into these in extreme detail because we'll go into them in more detail later, but there are six common use cases that we deal with at, uh, in social listening. The first being brand health, which is essentially, you know, protecting your brand equity. Uh, where do you stand in the marketplace in terms of your competitors? What are people saying about your brand? What are their perceptions? Then you've got crisis management, which is essentially staying ahead of risk. 
you know, uh, how do you stay ahead of what people are saying on the internet? Is it having a negative impact on your brand? Is it hurting your sales? How do you get ahead of that by listening to what people have to say? Then campaign analysis um, basically covers many, many different things uh, that typically in the past haven't been measurable. So when you sponsor the Olympics or when you run commercials on television, uh, you can now, through social listening, begin to understand what the audience at those events or the audiences on television think about your products by how they're responding uh, when the event happens. So you're able to get a more general idea of the return on investment behind campaigns based on what's going on with organic uh, media. Then you have market research, which covers a bunch of different topics from audience segmentation to influencer identification, to trend identification, to correlation analysis. We'll get into a bunch of those in, in a bit, but that's basically your blind data bucket. It's taking an awful lot of data and looking for trends, looking for spikes in volume, uh, troughs in volume, seeing exactly what it is that's driving conversations across the market. Then you have customer care and API and integrations, which are really closely tied together because ensuring that your customer care team is on top of all complaints, not just the ones that live on own channels, but the ones that live for the public at large to see is really, really important. So ensuring that your social intelligence data is linked with your customer care uh, department is really like what APIs and integrations are about. You're able to leverage that social intelligence data, match profiles, begin to understand more about what customer groups are saying and doing. So how do we align these use cases with business objectives? Well, basically, we do this really, really uh, simply by generalizing what business objectives might be for uh, businesses across all different verticals. So when you look up and down this list of six here, you see boost brand recognition, drive sales, retain customers, and build loyalty. That obviously is going to live in the brand health, brand equity bucket because it's all about keeping the brand where it is, elevating its position in the marketplace through sales and through customer loyalty. Then we have market research, which I discussed before, is all about identifying trends, target markets, demographics. So we're going to align those two. We'll align crisis triggers and competitive threats to our crisis management. We're going to be able to gauge the effect of an on, on and offline campaign through campaign analysis. We're going to monitor that word of mouth and sentiment to improve service across channels with customer care. And we're going to get our enterprise this transparent visibility into our whole social customer base through APIs and integrations. But now we have to begin to learn how to measure and report on this data that we're pulling into our organization. So you have to align these use cases with KPIs. So we have six common use cases here that are going to align with six common KPIs. Share of voice, social reputation score, earned media value, engagement rate, ROI, and reach. So when we move on to the next slide, you can start to see how each one of these KPIs aligns with the objectives and use cases that we've discussed. So when talking about brand health, what we want to know is what is our share of the volume of conversations? Where do we sit in the marketplace when it comes to what consumers are saying? When we're talking about trends in target markets and demographics, we want to know more about EMV or earned media value. What is it that's causing people to, to act, to react, to share, to interact across social channels? What is it that's providing the most value behind organic messaging? Then uh, for crisis management, you want to align that with SRS, which is social reputation score. This is basically um, a proprietary metric which combines volume and sentiment to create a measurement for your brand's reputation online. If it goes too low, then you want to make sure that you know, you're not hitting crisis or that a com competitive threat is stepping, stepping in and invading on your space. Uh, for campaign analysis, we have engagement rates. So you want to know how much people are engaging. How much are they sharing? How many times are they liking posts? How many times are they retweeting? Uh, and then for customer care, we have reach. So how far are people's thoughts, opinions, vitriol making it across the Internet? When they post negatively about your brand or even positively, where is it going? 
And then you have ROI, this enterprise-wide visibility into your social customer base. Uh, you're driving this return on investment. You're also seeing a return on the impact that uh, all of this organic messaging and social intelligence is having on your organization. So this makes us go back to our teams. So we thought about these teams at the beginning of the webinar. Now we have to start to see how do we align these teams that we were talking about, marketing, PR, customer care, sales, with these use cases. Well, that's the last step in our blueprinting. What we're able to do now that we've taken these business objectives or common business problems, we've aligned them with specific use cases so we know what type of data to look for. We're limiting our queries to the things that are important about these business objectives. Then we're aligning those with a measurement perspective. How do we gauge success or failure? We're doing that with social KPIs. And what teams are then responsible for these business objectives and benefiting as a result of these use cases that they're building within social intelligence? So obviously, brand health is going to be all about sales and marketing. Sales and marketing is uh, responsible for not only selling the brand, but for keeping them at the top of mind uh, in your audience base. Uh, market research is going to consumer insights and analytics. You need uh, really, really not super experienced analysts, but people with a keen eye for spotting trends in data so that you can begin to realize exactly what individual niche markets or demographics are saying about your products and how to leverage that, uh, that kind of strength of performance based on the qualitative data that you're seeing. So it's really not just a quant thing here when it comes to consumer insights and analytics. It's a granular qualitative thing in terms of looking at those everyday mentions and starting to spot trends and patterns in the way people are talking uh, across social networks. When it comes to crisis management, obviously we're going to align with PR and risk management. As I mentioned earlier, risk management is something that's uh, you know, becoming more and more aligned with uh, social in terms of the fact that, you know, social hits the world fast and it moves the world fast. Uh, when it comes to campaign analysis, this is all about proving marketing's effectiveness in immeasurable channels. So marketing is going to benefit tremendously as a result of the data that they pull from social intelligence. When it comes to customer care, that's going to your customer care team, obviously, but it's also going to product because customer care is learning more and more about the benefits and values behind each product. They could feed that to the product team so that it can inform the creation of new things or really enhance the improvement of old things. And then obviously you have your API and integrations that's going to align with the C-level in any organization because they're wanting to see exactly how this data is being leveraged and uh, benefited. So uh, we'll take a break for a quick question, uh, poll question here. Chris, you want to uh, ask the audience uh, our next question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what a great rundown of KPIs and moder uh, monitoring protocols. And here's our, our next poll question to get a sense of what the audience is doing in this arena. Uh, what KPIs, key performance indicators, do you use to track social media success this is a fairly simple poll question as well. Share a voice, sentiment, interactions, engagement metrics, or other. And if you're using other, uh, please let us know in your questions. We'd like to pose those as well. Now, as you're responding to the question, I'd like to remind you that you can view here and share this presentation on demand beginning at a later date. So watch for a notice when the on-demand presentation is ready. And of course, keep those questions going on. So what KPIs do you use to track social media success? I think all of the answers are in. Let's see how we've done. Well, far and away, interactions and engagement metrics, which seem seems like a rather complex and all-encompassing topic. Uh, Greg, what do you, what do you make of, of these results? Uh, you know what? I kind of expected that. Uh, in interaction and engagement me metrics are the most, excuse me, visible of, met of all metrics. So you can see them, but also your competition can see them. So it's something that is in the public eye, and it makes marketing teams, public relations teams, sales teams look at those metrics. Obviously, 
share of voice and sentiment requires a bit more analysis, not as public facing, so uh, not as popular when it comes to tracking your success uh, across social media. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to show you how all of those metrics come into play here with some sample uh, use cases. So this is social intelligence across the organization. These are descriptions of common business use cases. These are not clients of ours. They're just hypothetical situations of how real businesses could benefit as a result of uh, social intelligence being distributed across the organization. So the first one here is the Walt Disney Company. And I chose the Walt Disney Company. You might think that they might be perfect for campaign management because they want to track what people are saying about specific rides or specific movies. But I put them here in crisis management because as a, a tremendous global uh, you know, organization, they're not just about entertainment and putting movies in screens and putting uh, people in theme park rides. They have an awful lot of things going on at all times that are just setting the stage for potential crisis. So when you look across the four numbers, parks, properties, PETA, and pictures, what I try to uh, do here is make you understand that when we talk about parks, we're talking about the theme parks. So the theme parks are always running at all times, every minute of the day. So real-time intelligence is needed to manage crisis as it happens. Rides break down, injuries happen in these parks. Kids get lost and people are tweeting about it. They're posting Instagram photos about it. They're on Facebook about it because people have their phones at all times. So in this new mobile world, crisis for a thing like Disney could happen at any second. There's all kinds of risks and liabilities as a result of the fact that you run theme parks where people do get hurt and where illnesses do happen. So what you need to do with social intelligence is set yourself up to respond immediately. Social moves fast and operates uh, in a way that could create potential public relations nightmares. So obviously when you're talking about public relations, you've got the benefit here of getting ahead of these problematic situations by alerting for spikes in volume, by uh, constantly looking at qualitative mentions to see what's gathering steam behind interactions and engagements. So this also comes into play with properties. They're also being touched by public relations and marketing. They're being touched by risk management. They're being touched by consumer insights. You don't just have hotels when you're Disney. You have stores, you have offices, you have studios, you have real estate holdings all over the world. So it's not just uh, a problem when a an alligator uh, kills a small child at a hotel property in Florida. It's a problem when someone falls down in an escalator in an office building in uh, Japan. So what you need to be able to do as an organization like Disney is monitor these channels at all times to be able to stay ahead of what potentially could happen. You also have the problem of PETA. When you're an organization like Disney, you're working uh, in, a, in the public eye on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, you know, Groups like PETA love to target public eye companies. So Disney operates facilities, ob obviously, that care for exotic animals. They produce movies with animal actors. So they're under constant scrutiny by not just PETA, but other organizations that just love to protest things. So monitoring what's going on on social, seeing where people are posting pictures, maybe potentially heading off protests before they happen, you need this in order to maintain this family friendliness that you have as a brand. And then obviously you have, you know, the most public facing thing, which is pictures, the movies. So you have controversies cropping up all the time over movies. You're not just Disney. It happens to everyone. Are you racially insensitive when casting uh, characters in movies? Uh, are your movies being pirated across the internet? Uh, are there leaks and spoilers being posted so you need to be able to monitor for these things, not just to protect your brand, but to protect your future revenue. If you have pirated copies of movies out there, it's cutting into your bottom line. If people are leaking and spoiling movies before they come out in theaters, it could generate a huge impact on uh, the eventual box office numbers. So what you have to have is a team that's set up to accept all of this intelligence from PR, who's getting ahead of crises, 
by monitoring for potential situations that could cause liabilities of parks and properties, to marketing who's sculpting messaging around public opinion. They're putting the best things, uh, the best spin on things to sell them. So they want to understand what the market is saying so that they can begin to really get beyond the fanboy journalists and see if uh, you know what they're putting out there is really resonating with the public. You also have risk management, uh, which can really be helped with historical data from social. They'll begin to be able to see patterns and things that lead to liability. Are there particular parks, rides that break down very frequently? Is there a particular area on a property where people are getting injured frequently? They'll be able to see these things within social data. And then you've got your insights department. They're going to be able to see what people are thinking about these controversies that are causing uh crisis and they're going to be able to pivot their strategies when it comes to merchandising and retailing around this on the spot feedback. So you need to be able to set yourself up to accept this intelligence uh, for crisis management in much the same way that you need to be able to set yourself up to accept it for campaign analysis. So when talking about campaign analysis, I chose uh, Guthy Renker here because they're in a space that uh, is kind of niche and unique in that they do an awful lot of advertising on television and do uh, the majority of their one billion plus sales in television commercials. Uh, they also run kiosks and malls and obviously bring in revenue from other sources. They're a huge, huge corporate brand that focuses primarily on skincare, proactive being their most uh, popular and famous product, but they also work with Cindy Crawford and Heidi Klum on the Wynn hair care products. So they have a bunch of products that are driven by television campaigns. And for proactive in particular, these campaigns are heavily reliant on famous spokespeople. So whether you're Justin Bieber or Katy Perry, you, uh, you know, you, when you're stumping for a brand like proactive, you're getting out there and the purpose is to hit a specific type of demographic and get them to respond to what you're saying. So obviously Guffy is picking their spokespeople based on who they think is going to want their product. Now, when it comes to campaign analysis, what we'll want to do is look at things from four different perspectives, quant, qualitative, impact, and benchmark. So when it comes to quantitative, what's the total value of conversations around uh, each spokesperson? So who's driving the most conversations online when you run their commercials? And how do people feel about them? What's their sentiment when they see these people? Are they mocking them or are they accepting them for, uh, you know, like coming out and saying, you know, I have problems with my skin. This is a tough thing that a lot of people don't like to talk about online. And these celebrities are making it a much more visible and vocal thing. Um, and what topics are people writing about the most um, when it comes to these commercials? So are they writing about the celebrities or the celebrities inspiring them to write about your product. That leads us to qualitative, which allows us to dig into the mentions to spot these pain points. So you're not just spotting the pain points with what people think about your celebrity spokespeople, but you can begin to leverage the pain points with your product. You're going to be able to see problems with the sales funnel by looking at your conversations on social. What issues do people have with your phone operators, with ordering online? Do they have issues with your sales kiosks? Sometimes these are automated kiosks, which uh, are like vending machines. They have problems with those. You're also going to be able to manage this negativity one-on-one -on -one if you're staying on top of it. You're going to have your community manager, your marketing team, your customer care team responding to these people who have problems because you want to keep them. Your whole business has got the ranker is built on loyalty. You also have the idea of impact. So. Ultimately, can you correlate the volume of conversations around a particular spokesperson to actual sales while their spots are running? So while Adam Levine's spots are running, are you generating more sales than you were when Katy Perry's spots are running? So you're going to be able to start to see things like how much people are talking about and be able to correlate those to impact on revenue. You're also going to be able to get a greater idea of whether or not your spokespeople are having a cross-demographic impact. You might be choosing particular spokespeople to appeal to women, and they're actually driving more sales and more conversations amongst men. You also are going to start to look at, are 
particular spokespeople um, really effective at driving people to kiosk purchases? Do you see a spike in on-site purchases as a result of a particular uh, spokesperson's ads on TV? Then you have the idea of benchmarking your performance. So you want to determine what your baseline is for success. And you can do that with one brand like Proactive and then roll that over to your other uh, brands like Wynn or Cindy Crawford's product or Heidi Klum's product. It gives you the, this power to pivot quickly uh, if a new spokesperson isn't resonating. You're going to be able to see immediately if people don't like them by investigating your online conversations, and then you can switch. You have the ability to do that. You're going to use this knowledge across your entire product base. So marketing and sales is going to benefit. The team is going to leverage their learnings uh, from what they know about television campaigns, about their ability to generate sales, and they're going to use that to find the value props within your product that they need to elevate in future campaigns. And customer care and insights is obviously going to benefit because it's skin. People have problems with skin, so they're going to have problems with the things that they use to treat their skin. So the more customer care and customer insights has in terms of data and knowledge about what common problems are, what the trends are, how to help people, they're going to be able to do their job better. You have a historical record of real feedback on social media that could be used to inform everything from uh, response protocol to future product improvements. When it comes to brand health, I chose Boeing as an example because they're in a really interesting place when it comes to uh, the market that they're in. So this is a company that's in aerospace or aerodynamics. They employ over 150,000 people around the world, but they also are a target for things like espionage, environmental protests, the political climate, the advancement of technology. So they have a particularly keen interest in keeping that brand health where it is in terms of they don't want to fall off the map in people's minds. They want to remain at the forefront of technology and, a, a, and of aerospace. So the important things for Boeing when it comes to social intelligence are monitoring the competition, their customers, the landscape as a whole, and, the, and then the market, meaning the financial markets. So when it comes to the competition, you know, you have Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, uh, General Dynamics, and then you have these new players that are stepping into the space like Airbus and SpaceX. Don't forget space exploration and consumer space exploration really crosses paths with aerodynamics. So it's not just about air travel from New York to Paris anymore. It could be about air travel to the moon. So they're torn, Boeing, between this legacy of being like the biggest name in creating airplanes and moving into the realm of science fiction. So they need to know where to invest. Where's the competition investing? What are people saying about them? What are people saying about them in relation to the competition? So it's really, really important to keep an eye on this, which leads us to the next thing, which is their customers. They have customers all over the world. They work with government contractors, businesses, both public and private, and they're dealing with thousands of wild cards that could make or break their brand equity on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you can't keep track of every single customer and every single route that every single plane runs. So it really, they're, they're always at risk when it comes to their customers. And don't forget that customers aren't just the people who use their planes. They're the customers who fly on their planes. So there's like a six degrees of Kevin Bacon here when it comes to Boeing in that if you're flying on a United Boeing plane and you have a complaint about the shape that the plane's in, it doesn't just hit United, it hits Boeing as well. Then you have the landscape, meaning where are we going as a brand? As I mentioned, we're caught at this pivotal junction between like your legacy as an aircraft carrier and uh, science fiction of the future and flying people to other planets. So you've got this problem where the, just the global air fleet is aging and it's becoming technologically stagnant. How do you jump into a new space? meaning space, <laughs> which is a niche that they could potentially fill. You have other competitors that are trying to get in on that game. Uh, is it, you know, and you could also be using social intelligence to explore the fact is private air travel becoming a more reachable commodity. What about personal air transport, which you see videos of on YouTube all the time? What about drones? All these things fly. Boeing deals with things that fly. They want to keep an eye on this. 
And then obviously you have the bottom line here, the market. What are stockholders and analysts saying about the brand? What are they saying about the company's present and future? What are, what are they, is the day-to-day conversation about where the market wants you to go? So you have all of these things that can be leveraged by all these teams. You can sculpt corporate communications and investor relations by keeping an ear on both the public and the media's opinion. You can also align your product and marketing to learn from what people are saying and help sculpt this new image for your business as a leader in the new forefront of aerospace. So you have all, all, all of this like knowledge coming in that's going to help you pivot as a brand. Our next example here is John Deere, and I'm going to have to move because we've got only a very little amount of time here. So John Deere, uh, you know, obviously has a lot of customer care issues that they'll have to deal with. Uh, They make products everything from uh, refrigerators to bulldozers. So they don't just have to uh, explore unowned channels. They also have to explore uh, consumer reviews, parts and recalls, blogs, forums. So there's all of these things that they have to keep an eye on when it comes to making sure that people don't have problems with their products. People don't just complain on your official pages. They complain all across the Internet in languages all over the world, and all of these people need help. Remember, your end user for many of these tools is not 100% technologically savvy, so you have to be able to help them wherever they're complaining. And then you also have to be able to sculpt content for so many different types of audiences. The guy who likes to read about bulldozers might not be like be the guy who likes to read about power washers or uh, drills or generators. So you have all these different types of markets and customers, and you need to know how to respond to each one of them through content. You also have this idea of the ecosystem that needs to be able to feed all of this market across teams. If you have a customer that's frequently complaining about a competitor's product, uh, it's great for your sales team to know that because they know that they could go in and you know generate your value proposition as a result of that trap that you've set for your competition. And very quickly here, agencies can use market research across the board from everything from audience segmentation to influencer identification to sculpting the content that they use on their pitches to spotting trends that they can then elevate to their clients to modeling social data against already existing correlative data and then to helping them sculpt product launches around market needs and what different demographics are saying. I wish I had more time to get into agencies, but we need to get to John before we get to your question. So uh, what I'll first do is toss it over to Chris, who will ask you a poll question really quickly. And then John is going to tell us about Aetna's day-to-day social intelligence activity. It's a, it sounds great. And here is the poll question, and we'll do it quickly. Which use cases, after listening to, to Greg's uh, ter- uh, a terrific summation of that, do you concentrate on with your social listening? Please, please give us an idea um, uh, of uh, the ones that you use, market research, brand management, audience segmentation, product and campaign launch, crisis management, customer mem- management, or some other. And uh, as you're looking this over, remember that uh, we've made a PDF of the deck available for folks to download and you can do it in the resource widget at the bottom of your screen. This is an incredibly valuable uh, overall presentation, including the one that you're going to uh, receive on demand. So what use cases do you concentrate with your social listening? Here they are. Let's see what the audience has said. Mostly product and campaign launch, but overall, a pretty even distribution. Uh, Greg, John, what are your thoughts? Uh, this makes sense, Chris. This is what I expected to see. It's what we see here. It's actually spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a summation, uh, John or Greg, how would you like to wrap uh, this up? Or shall we go right to Q&A? What are your thoughts here? Uh, well, I think we're going to move on to uh, John, who's going to tell us about Aetna Social Intelligence in Action. I will uh, advance to John's slide here which actually got moved out of place. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. So, I'll, uh, make John, quick, <laughs> yeah, I'll make it quick. I'll make it quick. Tell us how Aetna uses social intelligence. Sure. 
So just uh, for the folks on, on the, the webinar today, we are structured, we sit within the marketing organization, which is a very common place for social listening and intelligence teams to sit. Why? Because that's typically where the social media organization is, um, is housed. It's where all the talent is. It's where the focus is. And as we just saw on the poll, uh, the initial use for social intelligence is for campaign and product launch tracking. So typically that's where it begins. Um, how we use it here is probably a lot like the hub and spoke or socket model um, that Greg spoke up earlier in the sense that one of the challenges of social intelligence is finding talent and also finding teams across the company or enterprise, whether big, medium, or small, where there's commitment to the data, commitment to the intelligence. And what we have found here is to have it centrally located is key because then we have standards. What data is important? What intelligence is important? The worst thing that could happen in a less than mature organization is for all the various disparate teams to be doing social listening and everybody has a slightly different take on what data matters, which metrics matter. And when data eventually gets rolled up to executives, they get confused. Well, which, which report is which? which? Which metric mattered here? Over here, it looks like we're doing good, but over here, it doesn't look like we're doing good. I'm confused. So what we found is to have the talent centrally located, and then as different organizations, for example, communications teams for crisis management, as they mature and want to have access and also have their talent be part of the social intelligence organizations, we have them become virtually part of our central team where they'll still stay on their team um, from an operational standpoint, but they participate in meetings, governance, and standards, and we're also making sure we're using the same tools. This keeps us standardized, and uh, we believe it, it makes the, the data and intelligence valuable because it's not confusing. So I know we're, we're at 1.59. I want to be one minute before the hour. I want to be cognizant of the time, guys. It sounds great. And, and uh, uh, John, thank you so much. And Greg, and now we're moving right into the Q&A. Uh, one of our audience members asked about monitoring sentiment. And, and when you're monitoring, it can, it, it can generate widely different results depending on the kind of queries. What advice do you give clients about ensuring that you've got consistency and continuously evolving queries as opposed to just one-off uh, wild things that you can't really, you can't really track well? Uh, Greg, would you like to uh, take that question first? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously sentiment is, is a problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to measure. Um, as a result of things like uh, irony or um, even just words like sick, which could be used in two totally different connotations. So the way that we do things with sentiment uh, at Synthesio is twofold. First of all, we're analyzing not just the word, but the words all around the word so that we can understand the context of how that sentiment should be measured. And then we have constantly evolving algorithms which are learning from past tagging and changing of sentiment on historical posts so that we can begin to learn from the type of context what is positive and what is negative. Now, obviously, that still is not 100% foolproof. The, the way that we like to advise clients is that you look at sentiment on a qualitative level uh, to determine what people are saying in their day-to-day -day mentions. But we like to look at sentiment more on a quantitative level using SRS, which is the social reputation score, which also takes into the account the amount of volume that's going on around a particular topic and determines whether or not that topic itself or the brand itself or the product itself uh, can move up and down a chart of 1 to 100 when it comes to social reputation score. So you're beginning to see... Uh, not just whether people feel negatively or positively, but whether that negativity and positivity are having an impact on your brand overall. Sounds great. John, would you like to uh, respond uh, quickly before we wrap up? 
Yeah, I agree with that. We use a social reputation score along the exact same lines that was just described because without that, sentiment alone, I would recommend is just directional. Um, it's still maturing uh, because of um, it's, it's just tough to read language sometimes when people text. So I, unless you're using it in conjunction with volume and in the SRS formulations, uh, sentiment numbers can be directional, but people should not hold on to just a specific number. Like we went from 65 to 70 in negative sentiment. That's really irrelevant. You're just not going to be able to measure that. Got it. Well, thank you so much. We've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. And please, uh, take a moment to answer our exit survey so we have an idea of how we did today. Now, remember, you can also view and listen to this presentation on demand using the same link you used today to attend. You'll receive an email as soon as the archive is ready. And don't forget, if you'd like to download the PDF immediately, you can do that using the widgets below. Now, thanks so much again for attending AdAge's custom webcast sponsored by Synthesio. Uh, on behalf of our guests, Greg Roth at Synthesio and John Murphy at Aetna, have a great and prosperous day.